I'm not dead. Though I'm perplexed, I'm not in despair. Have you ever been there? You ever felt crushed and thought, I I can't move another inch? Have you ever been there so perplexed? You're on the verge of despair, but yet God promises that a smoldering wick he will not blow out. A, a, a reed that is on the verge of snapping in two, he will not break. But that God comes along and reminds us that though we may suffer, there's a song there. Though we mourn in the night, there's something that comes in the morning. You know what it is? Joy. Are you kidding me? It's always darkest before dawn, amen? The sun's coming up. It's not all that bad. 100 degree weather two days ago, 70 degree weather now. See the little things we rejoice in. (laughs) Though we may suffer, and we will suffer, there's a song. There's a song. And Habakkuk wants to take us to that place. Because Habakkuk chapter 3 is a song for the church. It's God's way of saying, here you go as you wrestle through your questions uh, of, of doubt and your questions of perplexity and wondering, God, what are you up to? Because it doesn't look like you're doing anything. God, do you even hear me? Are you even there? Do you pay attention? There's a song that Habakkuk 3 presents to the church and it's written in such a way that we are to sing this because though we go through suffering, God says there's always a song. There's always a song for those who know that God is not only all they need, but God is all you have. This is my prayer for us this morning, is that we know that God is all we have. Therefore, God is all we need. Amen? Things are not going to work out the way you want them to work out. People will disappoint you. Your spouse is going to frustrate you. Your kids are going to hate you. But even if those things... Don't turn out the way you want him to turn out. God wants you to know he's all you need. So Habakkuk 3 is is where we turn, and and I'm not going to ask us to sing it. I don't have the music for the song, but we have the lyrics. And Habakkuk comes to the people of God and says, here's the song. The song that brings people from complaint to contentment. The song that brings people out of suffering into seasons of satisfaction. Like Paul says in 2 Corinthians, right? We're hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. And struck down, but not destroyed. I want that kind of resolve. How about you? That passage out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 was the passage I spoke on more than anything else coming out of seasons of darkness in my life. Perplexed, you better believe it. Does God always make sense? No. He's too deep to explain himself, but like I said last week, where God does not give explanations, he always gives revelation of who he is and how he acts. And therefore, the righteous will live by faith. When things don't make sense, I live by faith. When things are confusing, I live by faith. When I'm perplexed, I live by faith. When I'm on the verge of despair, I live by faith. Because you must walk in trust before him who knows all things, who's in control of all things, who cares for you more than you could ever imagine. Habakkuk 3. Turn your Bibles, if you would. Three things we need to discuss as we look at the song of Habakkuk as this man who is perched on his tower waiting in silence the spirit moves upon him to write a song 
Songs are great things. I don't know about you, but when something good happens in you, sometimes you bust out in song. We all have our different soundtracks, don't we? You know, maybe it's out, Uptown Funk, right? Like, I'm feeling good right now. I need a little Bruno Mars, right? I mean, even in Washington this week, when the whole Obamacare thing happened, song busted out among our representatives. Now, I heard this on the radio. I thought it was the Republicans singing, na, na, hey, hey, goodbye, right? Goodbye to Obamacare. But in actuality, I heard it was the Democrats singing, na, na, hey, hey, goodbye to the Republicans because they're not going to be voted back in again. No matter which way you look at it, I'm going, they're erupting in song. I'm going to tell you, there's something greater to sing about than, than health care. Not that that's not an important issue. But there's things that should move us to praise God. Though you slay me, God, I'm going to sing to you because you're enough. You're enough for me. And so this song is a song that addresses three things. And these are your, your, your blanks in your, in your notes. Number one, there's comfort in the God of mercy. Secondly, there is confidence in the God of history. And lastly, there is contentment in the God of satisfaction. And I pray that Habakkuk's words this morning would set our lives on a trajectory that just say, no matter what may go, may go on in the world, no matter how my life may be falling apart, I have God, and in that truth alone I shall be satisfied. How's that for resolve? Because we need that. We need that. We're looking for so many things to satisfy us, but God promises us nothing except himself. Habakkuk teaches us this. And he says in the first two verses, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to the Shigianoth. You know what that word is? It's a word that says, this is a song that is supposed to be stored in the midst of excitement, right? There's something about when you sing a song and your feet are doing this and your hands are doing this and you're just going, yeah, I just want to celebrate. Oh, yeah, another day of living, kind of like that. And he says, there should be excitement. And what are we to be excited about? Look at verse 2. Lord, I have heard the report about you and I fear. What's the report? Here's the report. God is bringing judgment upon his people. And not only will the people of God be judged for their waywardness, but eventually God will get to the enemies of his people and judge them as well. So what's he excited about? He's excited about judgment for himself and his people and their enemies. Is that something to get excited about? But for some reason he gets excited. Why? Because look at these next verses. Oh, Lord, revive your work. Oh, Lord, reveal your work among your people. And thirdly, in wrath, remember mercy. Circle that phrase. In wrath, remember mercy. Three things I need to unpack for you before we move any further. Three blanks in your notes. Revive, reveal, remember. God, Habakkuk says, we have forgotten you. We have forgotten your ways. We have forgotten your laws. It wasn't until King Josiah, at the age of, of eight years old, it's like, what are we to do as God's people? Well, we have some writings in the temple that we haven't looked at for decades. Maybe we should pull those things out. Habakkuk says, we have forsaken the ways, the will, the word of God for so long. God, revive your word in us. See, you guys, you need to understand how important the knowledge of God is. That the knowledge of God is what feeds your longing for God. If there's no knowledge of God, there's no yearning for Him. You know why Israel didn't yearn for God? Because they did not have knowledge of Him. They forgot Him. 
And can I tell you, at any earthly level, the expression of love for somebody is that you want to spend time with them. And when you spend time with them, you want more time with them. And you long for them because you love their companionship. You love their, the relationship you guys are able to have with each other. There's a level of intimacy you develop. The times I dated my wife that I, I did not want to go to bed hanging up the phone. Honey, keep, keep the phone on all night so I can hear you snore and breathe. I just want to be so connected with you like this. Right? Those, those longings to say, hey, uh, even though we were just together last night, hanging out, can we get together at 6 a.m., go on a hike together? And what are you doing for lunch? And then what are you doing for dinner? And then, you know, you, you can't get enough. And so Habakkuk says, revive, God, this, this, this knowledge of you that leads to a deep felt longing to be with you. And as you do that, reveal your will to your people. If there's no longing for God, then there's no longing for what He wants for you, what He wants for your life, what He wants for the world. So Habakkuk says, as you revive yourself, your will in us, reveal to us the way we should go. But notice how he he closes this section. He says, but please, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. Judgment is coming. That is inevitable. But what's great about Habakkuk is he knows the heart of God who wants to be compassionate, who wants to be loving, who wants to be gracious. And he says, God, we know mercy will temper wrath. God, I know this is going to be hard. This is going to be difficult. We will suffer. But Lord, in the midst of wrath, would you please remember mercy what a cry because he knows that without mercy god's wrath would completely destroy god's people he knows that without mercy there would be no opportunity for sinners to receive grace and that's the beauty of the message of god's love for for people is that there's wrath that is being built up against those who do not know him but that Wrath can be assuaged because God is patient. He is kind, and it is His kindness that leads us to repentance so that one day we will not receive His ultimate wrath, but we will receive His grace in full. There's a video. I'm going to post it later on Facebook. I was thinking about posting it before the service. I said, no, no, too many people will be distracted. You'll all be on your devices like, It's a a two-and-a-half-minute video of an Egyptian talk show. And there is an interview with a woman who is a Christian whose husband was murdered by Islamic group. And the interviewer is asking her questions, and this woman whose husband just died, who is a believer in Jesus, he died at the hands of, of Muslims, She communicates a message of forgiveness to those who killed her husband. And as she talks about the forgiveness, as she speaks about the forgiveness she's received in Jesus Christ and her hope in Jesus, the anchor of the Egyptian show is flabbergasted. You can visibly see him moved and choked up because he does not see love and forgiveness like this in his country. And he says himself, and you'll see it on the video later, these Christians have hearts of steel. These Christian, Egyptian Christians, love Egypt more than we realize. And he has moved to a point where he has not seen such grace and forgiveness and mercy. Why? Because this woman could cry out for vengeance. She could cry out for wrath. She could cry out for justice. But instead, she knows that there is a message to be heard about mercy at this point. And you cannot sit and watch this unmoved. And what does this woman reflect? She reflects the heart of God for us. If you have Christ, if you believe that He is the Lord, that He is the Savior, 
there is no condemnation for us who believe in him. And though that doesn't exempt us from suffering, what we do is we cry out to him, God, forgive us for the ways we've been wayward. As your kids, that we know you want something different for us, but he will always remember mercy when it comes to his children. But for those who do not yet know Jesus, the message is this. Today is the day of salvation. Do not test his kindness. Do not test his patience. While there is wrath against you, there is mercy, and that mercy comes through Jesus, just like we celebrated in communion. Amen? So God, in wrath, remember mercy. That even in the midst of judgment, the severe and ferocious love of God comes through and says, I love you more than you can ever imagine. Stop and, and know me and love me. So Habakkuk prays this for his people. It's just like what Deuteronomy says. Moses says, for the Lord is a merciful God. He will not abandon you or destroy you or forget the covenant he made with you. Isaiah 54 says this, for a brief moment I abandon you, but with deep compassion I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you. Aren't those amazing sections of Scripture? Oftentimes we forget them. Yes, God is love. Yes, we would love a John 3.16 world. For God so loved the world, yes. But we forget about the ferocious love of God, who sometimes He does things that unsettle us but ultimately it is for our good to trust Him more than we trust anything else. Amen? So there is comfort in God's mercy. Now He shifts gears and He's going to get historical on us and He's going to show us that we need to consider this God of history. What does Habakkuk do? Well, verses 3 through 16, he gives us a little history lesson because what we need to understand is that biblical worship is historical in nature. What we need to understand is our, our journey with Jesus is one of, of reflection of how God has acted in the past. Everything you have here is history. Think about this. The greatest history book of all time. But more than just a history book... This is a chronology. This is a catalog of how God is faithful to do what he promises to do. This is a catalog of how God acts in uh, many ways unexpectedly, in a lot of ways surprisingly. But one thing is true throughout this whole book, and this is what he wants you to know, is that this is a testimony of not only how God is true to himself, but how God is faithful to his people. And you read this, and Habakkuk understands the importance of this. He says, stop and consider the ways of God. Because the historical written word that we have of how God has acted in the past should set us up to trust him that he will be consistent to act like he did for us today. Does that make sense? When you're going through trouble, go back and look at the testimony of men and women of faith who journeyed with God even through the most severest of times and said, you can trust God. That's why Hebrews says there's such a great cloud of witnesses as you're running this race with endurance. They're waiting for you. They're cheering you on because they're saying, it's worth it to trust him. <laughs> as you're running, you're like, I just so want to give up. I just so want to be done. I'm tired of running. And the witnesses are saying, keep going. It's worth it. When they crucify you, it's worth it. When they saw you in half, it's worth it. When they take your family from you, it's worth it. And we sit there and go, it doesn't seem that way. And they say it's worth it because God rewards those who suffer for him. And so Habakkuk says, in verse 3, God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. And he basically sets the stage for how God delivered Egypt, uh, Israel out of Egypt. He divided the seas. He conquered, conquered Pharaoh's army. He goes into the seasons of the judges with Deborah and Barak. And he goes into Joshua where God stilled the sun and the moon and halted the day so that Joshua could be victorious. And he basically gives this litany of this biblical historical narrative to say, 
You think God can't do what he has done? You better believe it. Because here's the message. God always comes through for his people. He will always lead them through trials into triumph. You can trust him in the troubles. We look back. This is looking back. See, we treat this as, oh, there's this little cute plastic cups. Be nice with my little Barbie and Ken Malibu set, right? Like, look how nice they are, right? But, but do we not know that this, this little piece of bread points to a reality that we say, we, we tell ourselves this is going to save us. Not this, but what it represents. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this cup with this juice in it represents the blood of Jesus which is shed for you. And we come together and we remember what Jesus did. Why? Because 2,000 years ago, there is something that happened that has changed the course of human history. That God became flesh so that he might dwell among us and show us his way and teach us his will and to remind us that we can never do life without him and that there is no faith apart from him and there's no eternity without him and that he is everything and everything hinges upon these two things. This is why we look back. We sit there and go, this represents the body that God is not a distant God who loves us from a distance, but he came and dwelt close to us and he suffered for us. And yes, he endured mocking and he endured ridicule and he was beaten and he was lashed upon and he was ultimately crucified. And thank God that God did for us what we could never do for ourselves. That's what this means. So we look back and go, wow. And if God did not spare his own son. Do you think he's not going to come through for you on any other thing in your life? He demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, he sent Jesus to die for us. And if he's given you that, will he not also give you all things? And the blood that was shed, the precious blood of an innocent lamb, the lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. The Bible says that blood is precious because blood carries oxygen. Oxygen equals life. And Jesus had to die a very real death and shed very real blood. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, the Bible says there's no forgiveness of sins. And we sit there and we hold these two things in our hands and we sit there and go, the bread's dry, the juice tastes weird. The cups are weird. This is a whole funky tradition, but it's given to us because this is representative of everything we put our hope in. If Jesus has not been crucified, if he has not been buried, if he has not been risen again, the Bible says, then we are of the most men and women to be pitied in the world and our hope is in vain. But the fact is we must get historical And we must consider how God has acted. Yes, the Red Sea is a mighty thing. Yes, David slaying Goliath is an awesome story. Yes, God sparing Noah during the flood is incredible. But there's nothing more amazing than the fact that God himself would endure for us what we deserved, but yet we couldn't do. And he pays a price for us. And here it is. Are you kidding me? He who has saved us from hell and from wrath, and from judgment, he gives us life and hope. And that's why once a month we get historical. Is it worth it? You better believe it. I do it every day. Some people go, why don't you do it every Sunday? We could. But it's not the act. It's what it points us to. This is precious. Is it not? Has God been faithful to us? You better believe it. Has God proven himself time and time and time again? And Habakkuk says, consider the God of history, who is also a God who is eagerly anticipating. Just so you guys know, I I brought my own Kleenex, but I just failed to get it out of my pocket, right? Consider the God of history. That he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He delivered Abraham. He delivered Moses. He delivered David. He delivered Ruth. He delivered... You fill in the blank. Insert your name there. 
He will deliver you. How does it feel to be one of God's delivered ones? Yes. And though we may go through the fire, and we may go through the storms and the flood, He promises to be with us even in those dark moments. And He says, in the end, I will deliver you. Which brings us to our last point. Contentment in the God of satisfaction. I think there's a, there's a worthy thought right now that needs to be interjected. Can we learn to be patient? Look at verse 16. I heard and my inward parts trembled at the sound. My lips quivered. Decay enters my bones. And in my place I tremble because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. I think Habakkuk would be a lot like some of us who would just love to take matters into our own hands and and just do what we, we feel like God wants us to do. But we are a people who don't know how to patiently wait. Circle that phrase. I must wait quietly. Can I, can I tell you why this is important? Because some of us do not know how to wait, and we run ahead of God, and when we run ahead of God, we always get in trouble. Amen? Some of you don't want to admit that right now, do you? Some of us do not know how to wait for God. And there must be a willingness to wait patiently for him. Remember when biblical characters didn't know how to wait? Remember with Abraham and Sarah? Then there's this girl named Hagar. Abraham goes, hey, I can't wait for this, so I'm going to go do this. Trouble. Moses and delivering the people. Yeah, God, I know you said this, but I'm just going to go ahead and take the reins here. And God says, I wanted you to wait. And now look. We have to learn to wait. Psalm 37, verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. We had a mentor in our lives when we were going through some tough seasons who who told us about the crucible, that place where the heat is, the fire's hot, the pain is real, and you just want to get out of that crucible. And the mentor told Lori and, and me, Those moments you want to jump and you want to get out and you want to move on with things, sometimes you just have to wait and remain there. Can I tell you how tough that is? (laughs) It's the last place you want to be, but it's the very place God has you. And only He determines the time when the crucible season's done. Don't, Don't forget that. Too many of you are running ahead of God executing what's best, executing what's comfortable, executing what's easy, and God's saying, that's not what I want for you. Stay in the pain. Remain in the suffering. And at the proper time, God says, I will deliver you. Is that not true? And, And we sit here and we can sing about it now, Back when we were going through it, we were only cursing through it at that time. God, you love us? Doesn't feel like it. God, you want us to love you? We, we kind of hate you right now. But the sorrow has turned into a song. The, the mourning has turned into rejoicing. Because we chose to wait for God. Which ultimately then leads to contentment. Verse 17, and I'm going to tell you right now, just go ahead and just circle, highlight, mark these verses. I can't tell you when I mark these verses as a young believer in Christ, but this is perhaps one of the greatest sections in all of the Bible. Even though the fig tree should not blossom, even if there's no fruit 
on the vines, even though the yield of the olives should fail, even if the fields produce no food, even though the flock should be cut off from the fold, even though there be no cattle in the stalls. This is a pretty bleak and desperate scene. Yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation, the God who is my strength, for he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on high places. This is a picture of contentment. Circle that word in your notes. This is the very thought that Paul expresses in, a, in, in a Philippians chapter 4 where he says, Though I have a lot and though I don't have anything, though I have had tons of sleep and though I have, I'm going on 48 hours of no rest, though I am filled, there's times I'm hungry. But it doesn't matter what kind of circumstances I'm in. I know that in Christ I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yes, it's a great verse for your, your, your workout training area. I can do it. Paul goes, I want you to take it deeper. Because this has nothing to do with how much you're bench pressing. This how much has to do with how much suffering you're going through. Paul knew it. And he says, I've run the gamut of experiences. I've run the gamut of possessions. I've run the gamut of education and work and relationships. But all I want you to know now as a believer in Christ, Paul says, is that no matter what comes to you, it's not your circumstances you put your faith in. It's the God who loves you that you put your faith in. First Thessalonians 5. What's God's will? Ooh, the big million dollar question, right? What's God's will for my life? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Ooh, that's hard. Let's say that one more time because some of you are reluctant. In everything give thanks. You don't have to like it. That's not what it says. But you accept it. Because there's this theology that we claim to say we believe called the sovereignty of God. And if we believe all things have passed through His hands and He has permitted them to take place in our life, then we must in everything give For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. Though my job goes, though my health fails, though the forces of evil seem stacked against me, though the economy doesn't work in my favor, though the election doesn't work out my way, though I'm not appreciated among my friends, though it seems like everything is going wrong, there's one thing I'm not going to do, and I'm not going to pull the plug on the Lord. I'm not going to resent the Lord. I'm not going to have uh, this, 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 this issue of, of not going before Him with my doubts and my questions, but I will go to Him and question the way He's working, but I'm not going to stop questioning, for there's one other thing that I'm not going to stop doing either, and I'm not going to stop rejoicing in what He's permitted in my life. That's what He's saying. For you are my rock and you are my strength. And he gets to a point where he says, look in verse 19. He makes my feet like hinds feet, meaning he wants to run and jump on the most precarious of mountaintops and hills. Can you just imagine coming out of a season of of just questioning God and complaining before him? Now he's like, man, I just want to jump. He makes my feet nimble. He makes my feet quick. He makes my feet jump over candlesticks. I don't know, something like that, right? I'm ready to go. He says, this is awesome, God. Thank you. And, and he switched his mentality. And, and, and this, is, this is application right now. I want you to write two, two phrases in your notes. This is, this is going to seal the deal right now. Write the phrase, what if, 
dot, dot, dot. Because what if is the question that sabotages joy in our lives? What if is the question that causes great insecurity to, to rise up within our hearts? What if is the very thing we wrestle with before God leaves us unsettled, destroys our peace, leaves us with a lot of, lot of lingering questions? What if? Think about the Bible. What if God, who has promised me my son, Isaac, doesn't do some remarkable way of deliverance? There's Abraham. What if? What if, if, if Joseph's brothers come back to Egypt? What if our brother doesn't forgive us? What if, if, if Saul, the man who's chasing me and throwing spears at me, trying to kill me, what if, God, he kills me? What if the Roman government finds us? They've killed our, 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 our Savior. Now they're after us. What if we die? What if, what if, what if? What if I get cancer? What if my ch- children, what if my child rebels against me and doesn't walk with the Lord? What if I lose my job? What if the stock market crashes? What if Trump gets elected a second time? What if, what if, what if? Can I tell you, too many of us are guided by the what ifs of life. And God says, that is not what I want you to be controlled by. None of us are immune to pain and suffering in this world. Any of these things can happen to us. No one is free from tragedy and pain. There are no guarantees of an easy life for any one of us ever. Please, can I apologize to those of you who were sold a bill of goods that someone told you, when you come to know Jesus, things are going to get better. Sometimes they don't. Now, the caveat is ultimately they do. But sometimes it gets worse to show you how much better it's going to get. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Though... The outer man is decaying. The inner man is being renewed day by day. And the momentary light affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory of which we are not even prepared to receive because it's so amazing. But you cannot be controlled by the what ifs. What Habakkuk teaches us is there's a second phrase. Even if. This is the question of ultimate freedom. This is the question of ultimate peace. This is the question of ultimate contentment. Even if, God, there's no fruit on the tree. Even if, God, there's no fruit on the vine. Even if my situation doesn't turn out better, even if there's no cattle in the stall, even if everything just comes to a crashing halt and there's no evidence around me of your goodness, even if I will still trust you. Daniel chapter 3. You think Habakkuk's on, on something? He's not. Well, he is, but he's not. Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel's best buddies. They're besties, right? They're standing before a king that they refuse to bow down to and worship. He's threatening them with death, with fire. And they tell the king, even if you throw us in there and we die, we will never bow to you. Even if you threaten us by taking our life, There's one in whom we will trust forever and ever and ever. Even if, God, my spouse never likes me again. Even if, 
God, my child gets sick and dies at a young age. Even if my thought of a promotion gets past me and goes to somebody else. Even if I never have a car that's newer than 20 years old. Even if my ministry is never fruitful. Even if I never get married. I will trust you. We are not entitled to anything. We have this unequivocal written contract with God that we feel like, hey God, if I do this for you, you're going to do this for me. And we go to God as if, you know, there's a spiritual barter system. Can I tell you? The moment you say, God, I only need this to be happy, the very thing that you're asking him for you to be happy is really, in essence, your God, not him. Okay, let's, let's just come down to brass tacks right now. God, I just need this, then I could serve you. I just need this, and then I'll be content. I, I just need this, and I'm going to be happy. There's your idol. And God wants to get you to a place where he says, you have me, that is enough. Your faith is not in how your situation turns out. Your faith is not in your circumstances. Your faith is not in your faith. Your faith is in God who is ever faithful to us. Amen. See, Habakkuk may not have understood God's ways, but he certainly began to trust God's wisdom. Can, can you move into a season like that? God, I don't know what you're up to, but I'm going to trust you. You know what you're doing. Amen. His ways are perplexing. Yes. His ways are, are difficult to perceive. Yes. But is he wise? Did, did he pass high school geometry? Did he pass seminary level theology? Even with all the resources entirely spent, we have God. And in God alone, he is our strength and our hope and our rock in all situations and circumstances. Amen. Wow, Habakkuk is just, it's crazy, isn't it? but I love it because it's right where I'm at. And you love it because it's right where you're at. And we don't have to sit here and BS our way through, through our spirituality, do we? You know, we want Jesus to be all about daisies and fluffy poodles and popcorn and things like that, right? But the reality of it is, man, sometimes we go through hell. But the reminder is this. God is with us every step of the way. And perhaps he's trying to get you away from all the other stuff that you think is satisfying to remind you that your only satisfaction is him. Amen? Let's stand. I can't go on anymore, you guys. This is... <laughs> no, not another hour, please. I'm going to... I want you to know that we want to be here to, to just pray for you and I talk to you guys and you're going through difficult times and we love you and we want to journey with you forgive us for trying to explain what's going on in your life sometimes I have that problem and sometimes you just need people that are just present who are going to just love you and pray for you I'm going to have a couple of our deacons present with just to, to pray Mike Bachmeyer is going to be over here Tim Bike is going to be over here avail yourself to these guys who just want to Love you. Lori will be available to pray. And uh, Linda and uh, anyone. Just say, can you pray for me? We're desperate, aren't we? But we're not despairing. Because God is, is awesome. Father, 
Wow. You've revealed Yourself to us in ways that speak to those deepest recesses of our spirits. Where, where we thought no one could ever get in, no one could ever understand, no one could unlock, no one could shine a light in such darkness. But Lord, there's a, there's a freeing sense of, of your presence in the midst of darkness that, that fuels us towards something satisfying. That the journey is difficult and the, and the way seems long and, and your methods seem utterly confusing and beyond us, Lord. Your, your presence, the fact that you, you promise to stick close to us is, is all we need to hear. Thank you, God, for never leaving us or forsaking us. For God who, who promises to, to continue to reveal Yourself to us, that You're too deep to explain Yourself, but You're, you're more than gracious to, to, to accompany us in this thing we call life. And it's only because of Jesus, who, yes, has overcome the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah who has suffered for us so that we could not experience the level of suffering that He endured on our behalf. Hallelujah. But You have promised us life and life abundantly. And that's what we seek, Father, from You, the giver of life, the giver of hope. Apart from You, we can do nothing, but with You, we have everything. Remind us that. Show us that. Thank You for this morning, for this family. Guide and direct our steps, Father, and remind us that even if things never work out the way we anticipate them to, You are our God. And we will trust You. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift His face toward you and give you His peace and mercy and grace forever. Amen. God bless you guys. Pray with someone if you need that. We're here for you. Have a great week.